Uh, he's a creator and editor of Library Technology Guides and held variety of positions in Vanderbilt University Libraries at Nashville TN from 1995 through May 2012, including as the Director of Innovative Technologies and Research and as an Executive Director of Vanderbilt Tele Television News Archive. He's popularly known for his library technology reports by the American Library Association and the annual library systems reports. He writes a monthly column for computers in libraries. We are all very familiar. I think I used to look forward to his to the next uh, you know, issue of computers in library. We have been subscribing ever since uh, it started publishing. And he's on the editorial boards of Information Standards, quarterly published by NISO and the Electronic Library and edited and authored six books and written over 450 articles, book chapters, columns, or essays. So he's the recipient of LITA Library High Tech Award for Outstanding Communica Communication for Continuing Education in Library and Information Science. And he's, of course, the frequent speaker at various library uh, conferences in the United States and now more popular in India. He keeps coming to India every year. Uh, thank you, my Professor uh, Marshall Breeding, for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Start your Thank you so much. So I'm delighted to be able to talk with you for the next half hour or so about uh, at least my view of the, the future of libraries. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to come back to India uh, here in Bangalore, uh, having been uh, in India only a month ago in, in Kuchin. So uh, I'm, I'm honored to, to be able to come, uh, come visit. Um, so, as you know, I do a lot of thinking and research about uh, the technology that's used in libraries. Spend a lot of time kind of gathering information and writing reports about what libraries are doing currently and the trends that are going forward. Uh, in fact, as we are here today, I'm working on the latest issue of the library systems report, which I have to turn into the publisher in a day or two. So. Uh, really kind of working through kind of the most current information that I've been gathering on the technologies that are that libraries are using. So I want to talk about, you know, the evolving technologies and the future of libraries. Uh, you know, my, my view is the technology side of things. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. I do have some ideas about where I think libraries are going in the future. Uh, but I would say that, you know, what I have to say is more uh, questions than answers. Uh, I hope that I can give you a view of what's happening in the broader realm of library technologies uh, and then where that is taking us in the future. A lot of times when I give a talk I kind of limit it to what's going on in that country. This isn't really one of those. I want to talk about technologies that are happening kind of in the broader global perspective kind of regardless or not of whether they're currently uh, active uh, here in India. So I think it's important to kind of have the view of the broader world and then from that you can think about well what makes sense for the Indian context and so forth. You know that, I don't. Uh, so to go forward. Uh, so this I think is what's printed. You know, Libraries rely on technology for almost everything that we do. Uh, so it really is important for us to use the technologies that best help us achieve the mission uh, of our libraries. Uh, I don't want to repeat everything here. Uh, I think about the global context. I'm fortunate to be able to travel to many parts of the world and see technology in use in uh, countries uh, of all different kinds and regions and kind of levels of resources or not. Uh, so that really, you know, is helpful to me to be able to think about what the possibilities are uh, and, and where things are, are going. Uh, you know, global context, local context are, are things that we need to take into consideration uh, as we think about technology. So, um, what is the state of the art of library technology? Well, unfortunately, the state of the art of library technology is, is behind the realm of technology. Uh, we're downstream from the folks who do the original development of technologies in you know, Apple and Microsoft, Intel, uh, Facebook, and all of these other global organizations that 
have enormous resources in order to develop technology for the business and consumer and social networks. Uh, I don't think libraries will ever be the inventors of technology, but will be adapters of technology in order to serve uh, you know, our communities and, and our uh, home institutions. Uh, it's important for us you know, not to stay static. Uh, and we have a tendency to do that, to say, you know, we're going to, we find technology that works and we're gonna stick with it for maybe a decade past the time of its shelf life uh, that we would see in, in other contexts. So again, it's important to be more nimble and flexible about the way that we move through technology. And even though we won't be cutting edge, you know, how close to that cutting edge are we able to be as far as using technology that uh, is in the broader world? You know, our users, you know, are in the thick of that. Uh, their expectations are set by Google, by Facebook, by Instagram, uh, by Wikipedia, by all of the kind of day-to-day -day technologies that are part of our lives now. So we don't want a world of library technology that is kind of stale and flat and uninteresting compared to what they use every day. So I think it's really important that libraries be aware of this uh, broader global context of technology and try to keep up with that. Uh, should we expect the technologies that we use in libraries to evolve kind of step by step and get better a little bit at a time? Uh, or do we have opportunities occasionally to be able to implement technologies in a way that kind of turn things upside down for a while, that are new cycles of innovation? Uh, you know, I think that's harder, you know, I see fewer examples of that in libraries, but I think that's something that we might strive to be able to do uh, when it makes sense to do that. I believe that change is fundamental in the world and in technology, but I also don't believe in change for the sake of change. Uh, I think that we need change when it helps us achieve our, our missions better. Uh, you, know, li you know, I've been looking at library technologies for you know, more than 30 years. Uh, and you know, I've seen kind of lots of different cycles of change and kind of often frustrated by the slow pace of evolution of systems and you know, the occasional kind of glimmer of excitement when something really new comes out that starts changing libraries. Uh, so it's you know, not one single pattern, uh, a lot of different trends that have happened over the course of libraries. Uh, I think that you know, libraries by our nature are kind of conservative institutions. We are adverse to risk. We want to use the resources that are given to us carefully, and that often means kind of holding on to technologies uh, that we're used to. And I think that can often be a problem because uh, we need to be challenged, I think, to operate in different ways uh, when it means that we can better serve, serve our institutions. Uh, you know, these characteristics of libraries of limited budgets, uh, resistance to change, and aversion to risk kind of, I think, inhibit us as we think about engaging in technologies uh, that might be better suited to help us do what we do, but, you know, we have a hard time adopting them and, and finding mechanisms for their development in, in some cases. Uh, so what, it, what is the current state of technology as far as kind of systems? Uh, when I, you know, this is kind of what I study every day, that there are kind of several threads of that going on uh, in different types of libraries that, that serve in different ways. So the integrated library system uh, is this core business system that libraries use in order to be able to uh, automate our institutions, uh, is the basic business support for acquisitions, for describing collections. Uh, it emerged in the time of print and it still maintains a lot of that character. Uh, integrated library systems 
uh, kind of all over the world, including the United States, uh, continue to be well used in kind of public libraries, uh, school and special libraries that are really busy with print. Uh, public libraries, you know, I think are, you know, continuing to have vigorous interest in circulation of print materials in addition to uh, digital downloads of ebooks and so forth. So the integrated library system continues to be a good fit for that given enough kind of incremental enhancements and interoperability with kind of the digital side of public libraries, which mostly surrounds ebook lending. Academic libraries in a lot of the world uh, have moved on mostly to this new genre of software uh, that I call library services platforms. This is kind of a new genre of software new as in a decade ago, uh, that embraces the ability to manage digital, electronic, and print within a single platform instead of having you know, your integrated library system for managing print, some other system for managing uh, electronic resources, and something else for managing digital assets. So this idea of library services platform really start, came to being about 2000. 11 or 12, and has kind of been very well uh, adapted in academic libraries in the United States, Germany, Australia, and countries like that. Discovery is another core system that libraries use. Uh, Index-based discovery is the kind of mainstay of academic libraries now, where you have central indexes that theoretically provide access to the totality of scholarly and professional communications that then are able to uh, provide search capability kind of at the article level, at the individual resource level, uh, to be able to find the right materials that are available to them through library subscriptions and open access and, and other kinds of, of ways. Uh, there are issues with, with index-based discovery. Uh, they're important products. I think I may say something more about it later. Uh, they're, for most universities in the US, for example, they're kind of a must-have product. If you go to the website of any uh, US uh, <clears throat> university or college library, you'll see a single search box, and it's using one of these index-based discovery services to provide access to articles, books, and digital resources that that library is providing. It's nice to have. Unfortunately, it's not universally used. Is that fortunate or unfortunate? Uh, researchers tend to still use Google Scholar and other uh, tools in order to be able to get to that information. And I'll have more to say about some of these later. Uh, I want to say a little bit more about library services platforms because uh, as far as I know, they're not implemented in India yet. Uh, <clears throat> You know, it's a new genre of software, as I said. It's, you know, library specific. You know, it's uh, uh, used by libraries as kind of the technical infrastructure to automate their, uh, you know, operations, uh, description materials, and so forth, the kind of things that an integrated library system does, but it does it for uh, complex multi-format collections instead of mostly kind of around the models of print that the integrated library system has been doing. It's services oriented in lots of different ways. Uh, it's built out of APIs so that it can expose all of that capability to other systems, uh, discovery systems, other business systems, authentication services, all the other pieces and parts that comprise the technical infrastructure uh, that a university library is involved with. And they're deployed through modern multi-tenant web native platforms. Uh, in the same way that, you know, Facebook, you know, you don't install it on your computer, you don't uh, install it in your institution, it is a globally multi-tenant platform that all of us use kind of the same instance of. That same kind of Multi-tenancy is behind the library services platforms as well. Uh, you know, it's opposite in a way of integrated library systems where you install a copy of that uh, 
ILS for your library, for your consortia, uh, for your campus. So it really is a, a more modern approach to software following kind of the more pure software as a service model that pervades everything else that we do. All of the social network, applications, business software, uh, customer relationship management, all of these modern business tools are delivered in that way. Uh, the idea of locally installed software for a given institution uh, is you know, coming out of the days of client server uh, architectures and PC-based and server-oriented technologies that are not modern today by today's standards. So in the product world, there are two of those uh, left, I would say, um, that are well established. Uh, Alma from Ex Libris, uh, launched in about 2012, uh, has been uh, selected, if not implemented, by going on about 1,500 to 1,700 libraries now. So it has had kind of a constant growth in uh, the way that it's been adopted in academic libraries. Uh, it's uh, the other competitor here is OCLC's World Share Management Services. It is also well accepted, though by kind of smaller and fewer libraries. Uh, when a library, academic library, especially a large one in the U.S., goes out to tender for a new system, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of a narrow range of options. Almost always, it's Alma and WorldShare that are the short list may be supplemented by one of the uh, integrated library systems plus some uh, electronic resource management components, uh, but they're very dominant, uh, these two uh, library services platforms uh, in the United States, Europe, and Australia. These are difficult systems to implement. They're uh, they're shaped differently than an ILS. So libraries that have been automated with an integrated library system throughout their automated history find it difficult to implement these new systems often at in day-to-day -day life uh, because it thinks about library resource management in, you know, in a different conceptual way. So what I, I observe that you know, the libraries are uh, moving to these systems, uh, they're implementing them. The folks who use them are kind of grumpy about them because they kind of ru you know, rub against the grain for a lot of ways that they're used to doing things. But they're strategically uh, accepted. Uh, hardly any library that has implemented one of these systems has gone back to implement something else. Uh, so they're very sticky. They, they uh, have provided a level of strategic advancement for academic libraries beyond the integrated library system. Uh, and then they're also a platform to create new applications uh, out of that address other areas of, of library service. Uh, reading lists, uh, research data management, uh, you know, research services support and those kind of things are able to be built on the same platform that the library management capabilities uh, were originally built from. So <clears throat> integrated library systems continue to uh, have their place, I would say. Uh, the library world is complicated. It, uh, public, academic, school, and special libraries are more different than they've ever been, uh, and they are getting more different uh, all the time. I see libraries diverging by type, not converging. Uh, I think that there was a time when we thought that, especially as the world becomes more digital, libraries will all kind of work in the same way and have access to the same resources and, and do the same kind of work, but I don't think that's true. I think academic libraries uh, are dealing with much more digital, scholarly, and professional content and have different kind of business rules and ways to manage that than public libraries that are buying monographs mostly. They're buying books. Uh, they're buying books in print form. They're buying books uh, in downloadable ebook form. 
and the business rules, the delivery mechanisms, the lending mechanisms are in a way fundamentally different between those two business and legal frameworks. So different kind of uh, electronic infrastructure to be able to manage those. So libraries that are oriented to print uh, are still kind of okay and I think well served by the integrated library system. And you know, here, here are some examples that you're probably already familiar with. COA is very dominant in India. It's very dominant in Latin America. And it represents about, uh, I did an exercise just this morning, that it represents 14% of public libraries in the US and about 6% of academic. So, you know, they, it tends to serve small libraries well, even in the academic sector, um, complemented by some kind of other tool for electronic resource management, uh, and then public and school and special libraries. Uh, so there are a number of commercial products out there that are not open source in addition to COA, that is. And in the US, we have another open source system that's used by large consortia of public libraries called Evergreen, but it's not widely used at all outside the US. These are other common technologies that libraries have today. Uh, electronic resource management systems. Uh, there's an open source one called Coral that I think is used in India as well as other places. Uh, institutional repositories continues to be an important genre of software. Uh, though I have some uh, reservations about it, uh, I think that kind of broad disciplinary multi-institutional repositories ha are generally more, have more impact than individual institutional repositories. Uh, you know, I think that uh, universities around the world and including and especially the US, the institutional repository has been kind of a 20 year exercise that's never fulfilled its vision of representing the scholarly output and the research output of the institution. A lot of times, I say this kind of in a negative way, it's become kind of a dumping ground of some open source material that the library can convince the institution to put in it. They're not strategic. Uh, there was this vision early on that institutional repositories might even displace a lot of commercial publishing, but that really hasn't played out in, in the real world. You know, it, there are uh, a lot of other kind of strategic repositories, uh, you, know, uh, <clears throat> you know, in various disciplines, uh, archive and others that are strategic. Uh, if you're a researcher in chemistry, you're not going to go and visit every institutional repository of all your peer institutions to be able to find that paper you're looking for. You're going to want a more one place to, to look for, for these, this research. Uh, but there's a lot of options and this continues to be an important genre of software today, uh, though I think the world is going to evolve in, in different kinds of ways. Uh, libraries often are involved in managing collections of digital assets. There's lots of tools to do that. Uh, Islandora, Greenstone, Rosetta is a commercial option. You know, digital asset management uh, is part of what libraries are increasingly involved in, especially if you're a national uh, library or other cultural institution where it's part of your job, part of the scope of your work to be able to digitize and manage and preserve digital assets for perpetuity. But then, so there's new genres of software coming out today. So all of this is today, not tomorrow. We're already seeing the need to create technologies that serve this expanded view of what academic and other libraries are doing. A lot of that's already been mentioned today, uh, where course, you know, how, how does the library provide support for the curriculum in the best way? Uh, to use the assets that the university has already purchased through its subscriptions in support of courses instead of faculty members and their assistant, you know, finding content, making copies of it, putting it on course pages, kind of regardless of kind of the copyright issues. So tools that allow the library to participate in that process following kind of copyright uh, restrictions and obtaining resources uh, in all the right ways in support of the curriculum. Data repositories have been mentioned. 
libraries have a natural role to play in the research data process, writing research data management plans, and making research data available for peer review and collaborative research. I mean, it's part of basic science to be able to reproduce a study based on the data. So how do you get access to the data if you're a scientist working in a field and want to replicate one of your peers' uh, studies, uh, to be able to test it, to be able to use that data to do something else? You know, you've got to be able to get to it, and it's hard to get to in the absence of these kinds of systems. You have to write to the, the researcher, try to get a copy of it. You know, it may or may not be easily available to you, but it should be. So I think that is something that libraries are excited about doing in support of their institutions that has only kind of surfaced in the last three or four or five years as an important activity for the library. So there are increasing number of technologies in support of that. How does a library help the institution with its research program? Not individual research projects, but how do you help the university be successful in getting grants to support uh, science and research? How do you highlight the research that's done uh, you know, for the benefit of the faculty members and other researchers that perform that work? You know, most universities in the U.S. have an office of research, and they buy different tools to help them uh, manage the research of the institution. They have different kind of resources that kind of say, what are the funding opportunities? Again, this is kind of a natural role for libraries, uh, and that is uh, something that's playing out pretty recently. We're used to organizations like Elsevier uh, providing software and services related to uh, research data support. Uh, I mean, research services support. And now Ex Libris, uh, a library vendor, has uh, announced its uh, development of, a, of a, a new application based on Alma, they call it Esploro, to kind of help with that process as well, but it's one that brings the library in as a stakeholder, whereas some of the other approaches from Elsevier, uh, Clarivate, and Digital Science are really between the publisher and the researcher without kind of keeping the library in the picture of things. So I kind of like the idea of the library being a stakeholder in the way that the university manages its uh, research programs. Uh, again, a natural way for the library to be more important and strategic uh, in, in the university. How can we be the heart of the university? We've got to kind of not just do our traditional roles, but also explore new opportunities uh, that will be valued by the, the institution. I tell you, very few university presidents or chancellors or provosts know or even care what automation system the library uses. Uh, sure, they, they buy resources, they check out materials. You know, that, you know, what else can you do for me? So when the library is able to say, yes, we can help the institution manage its data, manage, you know, help it with funding opportunities, then those are the kinds of things that will kind of get the attention of the highest levels of administration in the university and help the library be more vibrant and strategic uh, in the way that it uh, interacts with the institution. Um, you know, there's lots of technologies in support of print. Uh, we're talking that that's a decreasing part of what academic libraries do, but it is a big part of what other libraries do, and there's a lot of kind of really interesting technologies that are, that are some well-established and some emerging in order to be able to provide more interesting and efficient services surrounding the management and access and uh, marketing, as you will, of print materials that, that libraries are involved with. So um, a couple of things that you know, I think a lot of this I've already said is that you know, based on what's happening now, what's going to happen next? Uh, we've already talked about some areas where libraries are stepping beyond traditional roles. Uh, I don't know what the others might be. Uh, you know, one is that 
more and more libraries are having embedded librarians uh, in, different, in different contexts. Uh, one that I know of is where medical librarians will follow uh, physicians and interns and residents on rounds. And so when they're talking about different type of treatments and drugs and so forth, they're able to provide research to support uh, a question that might come up in those processes. So not only just gathering resources, but being able to help the researchers uh, answer questions uh, in a more immediate way. We've certainly come a long ways. I think Google and Wikipedia have put ready reference out of business in libraries. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I mean, it's something that we could do, spend our time doing, but was it really uh, helping the institution? Uh, now it frees librarians' time to do more meaningful consultation in support of real research questions. Uh, libraries are able to uh, more on an appointment basis, work with students, graduate students, and faculty members in order to provide bibliographic and research support for the, the projects that, that, are, that are happening. Uh, discovery, I think, is uh, an important uh, aspect of what libraries do. Uh, I think we're at a critical point now. Uh, I think that a lot of the discovery products that are in use today aren't as effective as we kind of hoped that they would be. Uh, you know, they, they bring back results, uh, but they don't get used that much. And they're not as intuitive uh, and precise as they ought to be. The classic problem is when you're searching for a piece of uh, information, you get all the reviews about the, that uh, article or book, and you, you never find the kind of original material. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in the way that technology support basic resource discovery. And I think one of the tools and technologies that will help that, you know, is, you know, artificial intelligence, concept extraction and machine learning. Uh, there's already a few examples of that uh, happening today. Uh, and I think those are the kinds of things that, that need to uh, emerge in the future in order to reinforce the library's role in discovering resources on behalf of students, faculty, and, and other researchers. Um, <clears throat> how you get access, you know, uh, I guess I push back against the idea that information is becoming more democratic. Uh, I think that there's still a lot of obstacles in getting access to uh, scholarly information. Uh, you know, you, you are at the mercy of what your library can subscribe to, else you run into paywalls and you can't get to research in any easy or legal way, uh, even though there, there are uh, other kinds of repositories of pirated articles that you can get to. But the, you know, I would say that there are huge difficulties in getting access to information. Uh, if you're not associated with an institution that subscribes to the materials of interest to you, as I am no longer associated with Vanderbilt, I find it extremely difficult to get to uh, research articles about library science. Libraries continue to publish uh, in uh, paywall journals. Uh, you know, there's some open access as well, but it's very uneven. I think scholarly communications arena is in flux. Uh, there's probably opportunities for uh, more uh, open access through a lot of the initiatives that are underway as we speak, uh, but it's going to be a while now, uh, f from now until the whole body of information that we, that we care about in libraries is available as open access. So until that happens, I would say that access to scholarly information isn't very democratic at all. Uh, it's mostly proprietary and commercially controlled. So, that's our reality. I don't want to say it's a good or a bad thing, but it's our reality today. I think we're hoping for more uh, open and democratic access to information in, in the future. Uh, so if you, you know, I would say that right now we think about kind of subscription and open access as kind of the two business models. 
There may be other business models in the future that our discovery systems, our resource management systems are going to have to navigate. So we need to be prepared for not just this binary world, but for a more complex world. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, AI and discovery services, you know, uh, I mentioned as the one that has at least caught my attention as one that's able to use something beyond keyword indexing uh, to provide rational discovery of information to, to researchers. Uh, libraries need to have more engagement built into their systems, uh, you know, more personalized services, uh, kind of anticipation of what a researcher, a searcher might need as they approach these systems. How do you do that? It's kind of w well done in the e-commerce and commercial arena. You know, uh, Amazon and other uh, e-commerce platforms kind of know what you want before you do. Libraries aren't that good at anticipating kind of the, the questions that researchers bring to their systems and be able to make kind of helpful suggestions uh, when kind of the obtuseness of our interfaces uh, keep researchers from getting to the materials that they're looking for. Uh, so kind of more of that use of kind of whatever data is available uh, but in a way that reflects library values of protecting patron privacy. So in a way, our job is harder than Amazon's because they know and share everything about you. We want to know a lot about you to help you, but share none of it with others. So these are very difficult problems to, to navigate. I would say that in the future that libraries have to move toward more collaborative infrastructure. Uh, it is you know, absolutely the most inefficient way to automate libraries as one library at a time. Uh, that the idea of regionally, globally shared platforms are the tools that libraries need in order to be able to do things like collaborative collection development, effective resource sharing, and other activities that libraries don't have the resources to do individually that we can uh, do better uh, as collaborative partners. So individual uh, silos of automation, library by library, I think present obstacles to uh, you know, large scale collaboration that I think that is built into the library DNA, but we're not taking advantage of the technologies that help us do that. So I think we need to kind of realign technologies that help sharing and collaboration uh, that we want to do anyway, uh, but it's, it's difficult to do. Uh, so, you know, cloud technologies is the way of the world. Uh, implement, you know, buying servers and, and loading software on it is the way of the past. So again, I encourage libraries to think about kind of at least implementing technology in modern ways in order to be able to support our work. No library has infinite resources to buy the materials that they need, so it's more and more important to increase the impact of the collections that we have through sharing and you know, lending and borrowing from each other. Uh, I, you know, I'm involved in lots of resource sharing projects in the U.S., uh, even large-scale storage of books. I work with the Recap Project, which is shared but uh, a 20 million volume storage facility shared between three universities, and working on making that a shared resource so that researchers from one institution can request anything out of the shared collection, regardless which institution put it there. So I imagine kind of a wide-scale version of that where print materials that are kind of bought, you know, in much smaller numbers, but still kind of needed. So how do you kind of share those in ways that, that make sense for a scarce resource? Um, so all of this has to do with the future of libraries. You know, what technology you need for the future has a lot to do with what you think libraries of the future are going to be. And I hope you know that better than I do. Uh, I can only guess. I'm an optimist when it comes to the future of libraries. I, uh, you know, I kind of respond to the challenge that libraries will eventually, you know, go away through the digitization of content. 
uh, I think that you know that really isn't the real world that we face that universities will always need some organization within it it might as well be the library to acquire uh, describe and provide access to the content that is used in teaching and research. Uh, it is a very specialized craft, as you know. Uh, the business rules, the way that you buy things, whether it be on print, subscriptions, you know, are, you know, you know, maddeningly complex. So, you know, it's not something that a computer uh, technician is going to be able to do for the university. It takes, you know, professionals with the skills to understand the body of scholarly communications and the rules at play to get access to that on behalf of your institution. So it's never going to be a purely technical and automated task. It's always going to be an intellectual task that I think libraries will do in different ways for their institutions, especially as the nature of content evolves through different kinds of media. We think of today as you know books ebooks e-journals you know in the future it may be holograms and other types of content uh, used through virtual reality and other media in order to be able to satisfy the needs of the institution those will come with their own business rules that we'll have to figure out and instill in the systems that we use to manage them uh, so you know they, they provide relevant uh, services and collaborative spaces, uh, I think even the physical future of uh, library facilities and academic libraries is important. Uh, to have a place where students and researchers can come together and collaborate and not only uh, acquire and consume content but create with that content and the library provides the tools in order to be able to do that. Uh, been to some libraries, for example, that uh, not only provide access to video content, but they have professional quality television production facilities in order to allow theater students and others to be able to actually create content uh, using facilities provided by the library. Public libraries, I think, will continue to be important. Or, you know, I think they play an important role for society. They're valued institutions. Uh, they can make a very large impact on the communities that they serve. Uh, you know, it's uh, Im you know it's important. It, it's it's exciting to watch young families go to the library to instill in their children the love of reading. Uh, it's important when the library is there to help someone looking for a job be able to fill out an application on the web because they don't have a computer or internet access at home. So libraries provide a valuable role to society. They do now and I think they will in different ways in, in the future. Uh, so what, what libraries do, uh, I think they will do in different ways as, library, as society evolves. And again, we can only guess you know, what society and what issues and what challenges will face us in the, you know, 15, 20, 30 years from now. And the time is now to kind of think and anticipate, you know, what, what models of library service and what kinds of technologies will help uh, libraries succeed in, in doing that. We're in a time now where information is complex and skewed, I would say. We, we live in a time of fake news. We live in a time of manipulated social media uh, that has a huge impact on politics and society. Uh, how do we undo that? How do we you know, make information that's socially shared kind of real and genuine again? It's not now, I don't think. Uh, the thing that's emerging now, maybe you've seen it, it's called deep fakes, where you can create video of someone that either may or may not exist saying something that was never said in a very convincing way. So how do you distinguish video that you see on your screen that is real versus something that's been created in this very complex kind of way that technology enables uh, to be done? Libraries, I think, will do now and in the future will pay a role in understanding objective information. 
I think the challenge to do that in the future is going to be a lot harder than it's been in the past. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to leverage libraries' expertise in metadata management, things like digital forensics and preservation, uh, in order to be able to address inauthentic content and help society uh, kind of understand authentic and real content uh, as we kind of face important social and political issues in the future. Uh, what's the library technology to support all of that? Well, I think it's just important to kind of stay up, to be modern, take advantage to the fullest extent that we can of the of the new developments that are coming in different aspects of computer science and technology to be able to apply them to our craft and mission. Uh, to be flexible in the way that we build any software in the future, uh, to accommodate things that, we, that don't exist now and we don't know what they'll be in 10 years from now. Uh, to be abstract, to not hardwire things into systems, but to be able to build systems that, that deal with information in lots of different forms, that work with metadata in lots of different forms. Dublin Core, Mark, things that haven't been invented. Uh, those will be part of our lives in a, a future that's nearer than, I think, than we think. So, um, you know, I think that we have to be oriented to uh, the evolving expectations of society. I think that's kind of, kind of the main point that I'm thinking is that we don't know the future, but we have to be open and proactive in the way that we use technology intersected with the role of libraries in order to face these challenges that are, that are coming in the future. Uh, to be kind of digital first, but not get away from the fact that uh, content will come in lots of other forms as well. Uh, to apply to all these different publishing models uh, that are changing, we know what the ones uh, in play are now. Uh, they won't be the ones that are in play 10 years from now. Uh, I think we're in a real interesting period in scholarly communications where a lot of the assumptions and business models that we are used to are on the verge of collapse. Libraries have a role, have a responsibility to protect, to protect privacy, I think. Uh, you know, different regions have different approaches and values and, ab about that, but I think that that's what makes us different in the commercial world is that we value the privacy of those who use our, our services and materials. And that we have to demand that everything be open as far as our technologies, because that makes it flexible to be able to do things beyond what the initial design uh, was, was done to do. So kind of a spirit of openness, lots of relevant stakeholders to be able to, to use technology in flexible ways, to use content in flexible ways. And then to find ways to sustain that development, uh, especially uh, in the context that resources that libraries have are incredibly scarce. Uh, so how, how, how do we kind of meet all these challenges uh, when, when we don't really have the resources that I think that we want to have in order to develop that next wave of technology? So sustainability, I think, is important. Uh, to be open to any possible way to create these technologies, whether it be through community open source projects, through uh, projects that commercial vendors might do. I think it's all for the good. We need to be able to, uh, to build effective technologies in the future uh, in different kinds of ways depending on uh, what the project at hand is and, and who those are that are available to, to address it. Okay. Uh, I think I want to just kind of skip. Uh, okay. I've probably gone way beyond my time. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, we are just kind of in this mode where we need to kind of step back, look at where the things are now, what is it pointing to, and know that we have to plan for something else in the future. Uh, the status quo, the kind of conservative approach of libraries to slow and evolutionary adoption of technology, uh, we're going to need more than that 
in the future uh, as we kind of face these really hard problems uh, going forward. Uh, so I think I just want to stop. Uh, I, I could talk for another two hours, but um, I hope that we have time for maybe a couple of questions. Uh, we didn't want tea or lunch or anything, I hope. So. Any questions? Sir, uh, thank you very much. It was indeed a very nice presentation on uh, innovative technology for the future libraries. My question is, sir, about for uh, collaborative platform. Uh, as far as uh, the bibliographic data is concerned, uh, we are more safe when we go for the cloud. But when we talk about sharing the digital object or research data, so how do you uh, find the collaborative platform safe for the research organization? And if not, then what are the preventive measures to be taken? Sir, if you just highlight a few things. Okay, so if I think I understand the question is that, you know, so we, we can think about, you know, kind of the, the Facebook uh, bibliographic information. It's easy to create platforms that widely share bibliographic information, metadata about things. How do you provide the same kind of content to provide things? Provide data, provide uh, digital objects, uh, those kind of things. I think it's not really that different these days. Uh, the scale doesn't matter. Uh, we're in a time where you, know, you can get access to terabytes of storage at, at very low cost. Uh, you know, cloud technologies are good at that, I would say. Uh, when you look at the common social networks, you, know, you have uh, Facebook and Twitter and others that store massive amounts of original digital content. So how do we do that in ways that libraries need to that provide access when it's supposed to and preclude access when you can't? Because I think that that's the legal and business framework that we'll always have is you know, having to restrict access, uh, access to content that exists because you can't legally present it uh, in different contexts. So those have to be built in just like they are and kind of any other system. Uh, I think it's just the way that multi-tenant platforms work that it, in a way lend themselves to doing that uh, just as well, if not better, than kind of individual server-bound systems. Just because it's in the cloud doesn't mean that it's universally accessible. Uh, you know, businesses keep their most propri proprietary information in cloud-based systems these days. Uh, case example, uh, you know, are the uh, Salesforce-based applications where a company will have kind of all of its client lists, its most proprietary business assets up there on the cloud using software provided by uh, this uh, cloud software company. Their competitors are all also doing the same thing. Uh, their secrets are there, your secrets are there, and you know, it's vital that they never cross paths. And so, you know, the biggest co companies in the world trust ta cloud technologies to do that. So I think in the realm that we work in, in libraries and information, that yeah, those same kinds of technologies can be applied that way. I'm not saying that there are applications that currently exist that do do it that way. Does that get at what you're asking? Microphone? Uh, yeah, oh, my, name is, uh, my name is Akhtar Parvez. I'm from Maulana Azad National Urdu University. So you said you had uh, apprehension about use of discovery, right? And uh, see, uh, I was exploring to use uh, VU Find. Uh -huh. So since you are a technology expert, I thought, you see, I'll take your uh, advice on this uh, using uh, VU Find. Okay, interesting question. So what is ViewFind? ViewFind. It is a discovery interface. Uh, it is a very nice user-facing web-based interface that knows how to interact with indexes. Uh, you know, it has faceted navigation. It has a lot of the basic things that libraries expect in the search interface they present to patrons. So what's the index part of it? Well, so ViewFind 
uh, kind of like black light, you're in the same category, can interact with a local index that you create. So you can uh, take a digital collection, put it into solar, which is the indexing technology behind those, maybe Elasticsearch, and create a local index of some finite body of content. Uh, that will be then using kind of the keyword indexing that comes with those uh, search technologies, and you can optimize it as best you can in order to be able to find content. That's different than the index-based discovery services like Summon, Primo Central, EBSCO Discovery Service, and WorldCat Discovery Service that have these massive kind of billion record central indexes that represent the totality of scholarly communications. So, you know, viewfind is fine if what you want to do is provide access to a limited body of information or if you want to use it to interact with the API of EBSCO Discovery Service or Primo Central to kind of bring that content into it too. But keep in mind that then what Viewfind is is just the top cosmetic layer uh, behind local indexes that, that you're working with and central indexes that you might also interact with. So you're still kind of left with the same problems. It's all keyword based. And you can do a lot with that. I'm not saying that that won't be enough for your application, but I'm also suggesting that that isn't the way of the long-term future either uh, as you try to solve discovery in more sophisticated ways using AI and other technologies. Viewfind doesn't have AI built into it. It has keyword indexing built into it. Does that help? Oh. Yes. <laughs> Make things more complicated? Yeah, okay, I think we are running behind schedule. Okay. So we will be late for lunch. You have a question? Do we have time for another? Just, just a quick question. I mean, uh, I would like to hear your opinion about the recent trend that where content uh, owners, like uh, big uh, publishers, they start acquiring technology companies and how this will affect the technology openness. I mean, apart from Koha, there is no other I mean, viable software like for ILS uh, open. Okay, um, so it might be a quick question, but the answer may not be as quick. You know, it's complicated. Okay, so first, as far as open source software, uh, you know, there's also Folio. I didn't mention that. It's in development. And I think there'll be libraries using it in the next few months. So interesting to see. There is no connection between open source software and open access to data. You can, the openness of content has little to do with the license model of the software that you use to provide access to it. To get back to your other question, what, so we observe that Elsevier, Clarivate, Digital Science, uh, Sage are buying these content pieces and parts. I have a slide that I don't have with me that kind of shows this matrix of capabilities that each of these organizations, notice I didn't call them publishers because they don't call themselves publishers anymore, are doing in order to get access to scholarly information and workflow processes prior to publication. I think that's the game now. How do you, in an era where it might be less possible to monetize content, how can you monetize research workflows? So that I think is the strategy that's playing out among the top level uh, workflow and analytics companies as they call themselves now to find kind of new ways to provide commercial services into the research community. Agree, disagree? <laughs> So I think I'm out of time. Thank you so much. I hope this has been at least somewhat interesting to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marshall.